Bonjour. J'enlève le masque. Welcome to everybody. Euh, vous êtes euh, une centaine ici, à Brest. Et vous êtes euh, plusieurs euh, dizaines, me dit-on, pas loin de centaines de milliers à écouter euh, ce débat. Et nous avons souhaité que, évidemment, sur le sujet polaire, euh, nous puissions vous réunir. Et vous avez, euh, pour ceux qui nous regardent, l'occasion d'entendre des voix fortes, des voix affirmées, des voix internationales euh, sur ces sujets des mondes polaires. Euh, comment parler de l'océan Comment faire un One Ocean Summit sans, évidemment, euh, parler euh, des pôles One Ocean Summit with its salt must vous connaissez le sujet par cœur, vous qui êtes là ici présent, par montrer les cartes euh, du nord et du sud, de l'Arctique et de l'Antarctique. Mais vous savez à quel point euh, ces deux histoires sont les mêmes. Ce qui se raconte, ce qui s'écrit, ce qui se passe au pôle, ce qui se passe dans les mers, dans l'océan, tout ça est une, une indivisible histoire. L'histoire euh, est magnifique, elle fait rêver, elle a conduit beaucoup d'entre nous novices à s'intéresser à, à ces mondes que nombre de vous, d'entre vous ici dans cette salle euh, connaissent bien. Je n'allais pas dire visiter, parce que vous avez vécu parfois longuement, parfois en Antarctique, dans des conditions extrêmes. Euh, ce dont nous parlons n'est pas uniquement l'aventure polaire, qui a beaucoup fait rêver euh, les générations euh, dans le monde entier. Euh, au siècle passé et encore au siècle d'avant. J'ai d'ailleurs du plaisir à, à lire et à relire, et je voudrais euh, juste citer deux livres que j'ai reçus il y a maintenant dix jours et j'ai eu du mal à, à m'en échapper, qui sont L'explorateur d'océan de Jean-Louis Etienne, un livre magnifique qui raconte son, son parcours. Ocean Explorer. Parce que lui est un explorateur, euh, c'est explore. un médecin, mais euh, euh, ce n'est pas but, um, un scientifique au sens de chercheur traditionnel, quelqu'un qui s'apprête à partir, euh, comme vous le savez, bientôt sur son polar pod and, uh, euh, dans l'océan Austral. Et puis, euh, euh, retour en arrière un peu avec Pythias. Pythias, c'était un de vos prédécesseurs, messieurs, mesdames. À perte de vue, la mer gelée de François Garde. Tous les deux chez le même éditeur, Frédéric Paulsen, enfin Paulsen en l'occurrence. Voilà, puis j'en profite pour citer aussi un numéro de Beaux-Arts, une revue française qui est consacrée à la banquise avec des images magnifiques de grands photographes sur l'Arctique et l'Antarctique. Après ce petit moment de présentation de kiosques de librairie, Peut-être juste un mot pour, uh, pour conclure, pour, uh, pour parler des pôles pour de la France, de l'aventure polaire. C'est une aventure, c'est une histoire, has, uh, euh, mais c'est aussi surtout uh, uh, une projection que nous devons construire uh, traveling to avec les outils nécessaires. To uh, ici présente uh, notre amie, uh, la directrice uh, générale de l'Alfred Wegener Institute, qui interviendra tout à l'heure, et que j'ai eu le plaisir d'aller visiter à, à Bremerhaven, et nos échanges uh, que j'ai pu avoir avec... Uh, Jérôme Chaplaz, uh, le directeur de l'IPEV, so à qui je veux rendre un, un très grand Boishis, hommage, and then we have Dr. Jérôme euh, hommage Chaplaz, parce qu'il euh, ne va pas bien, il va très bien, is, mais son terme euh, à la tête de l'IPEV s'achève, et, euh, et Jérôme va vivre de belles aventures, mais on a eu suffisamment de complicité ensemble avec Jérôme pour ne pas se rendre compte que nous n'étions pas encore d'équerre, nous n'étions pas encore à la hauteur des attentes à la fois des citoyens, mais plus généralement de ce que la France veut être comme puissance Et le président de la République et le Premier ministre ont donc commandé une stratégie polaire nationale grâce à la réunion du traité de l'Antarctique que nous avons organisé en juin dernier. Cette stratégie s'est écrite avec nombre d'entre vous en France, mais beaucoup à l'étranger. Et elle sera, je crois, annoncée dans quelques heures, en tout cas annoncée en tant que telle. Euh, officially, lors, euh, very du soon, sommet politique euh, at, le 11 février et présenté d'ici euh, la fin février summit, and, uh, en, en détail late par late le February Premier ministre. We'll voilà, c'est pour dire que nous aussi, Français, euh, à l'échelle, à l'image de so, tous les pays qui sont euh, concernés, qui sont très nombreux, qui mettent des moyens, nous sommes Similarly prêts euh, à coopérer, à travailler de manière vertueuse, durable, avec d'autres pays du monde partout, en Antarctique, en Arctique, 
pour ce bien commun. Voilà, j'ai trop parlé. Vous avez la chance d'avoir un excellent modérateur. Je vous le conseille. Il est brestois. Il s'appelle Paul Tréguer. À toi, Paul. Paul Tréguer, qui est de là, ici, à Brest. Il est professeur à l'Institut Institute for Marine Studies à l'Université de Brest. OK. So all scientists who have been uh, to, Antarctic, to Antarctic have been fascinated by the beauty of the landscape, um, uh, but they can also be very hard, as you know. Uh, this workshop is a unique, a unique opportunity for you to meet um, some of them, some of the scientists, polar scientists, who actually are kind of lovers of polar ocean and regions. Speaking of love is a nice way to start this workshop. However, and uh, I now have a very sad news, actually. Yves Renaud, the former director of the French Polar Institute, just passed away. And so, with your permission, I would like to dedicate this uh, Polar Ocean workshop to Yves Renaud, okay, which will be a positive way to uh, Well, to show how great was it achievement. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so thanks to your excellence, um, honorable, honorable guests, dear professor, directors, and your colleagues. I'm very honored to have been invited by your excellence for, to take part in the organization of the, this workshop, actually chaired by my dear colleagues, Jérôme Chaplaz and uh, Antje Boetus. Uh, he is from Brest, France, and she is from uh, Bremerhaven, Germany. And so the Polar Ocean Workshop is in the context of severe impacts of climate change on the two polar oceans. And we have identified three major topics will Iran be considered. Should work. Thank you. So the first one um, is about the trans dynamics and the connection to energy, um, ice sheet and carbon balances. I will introduce uh, first of all the speakers. The second one is life in polar seas, trans threats solutions. I will introduce the speakers later. And the governance of polar ocean and the role of international fora. I will also introduce um, the speakers later. This is the first time of this workshop. The second period is after a discussion um, where I will invite uh, some of you to, to speak about uh, their comments and suggestions. Um, the second step actually is to identify one call for action. And so after the different contribution, this will be proposed by Antje Boetus uh, to be submitted to the 11th February conference, the one chaired by President Emmanuel Macron. Okay. So we are starting with the topic number one, of course, and would uh, Judith, Jean-Baptiste, and Jérôme take place at the board of, of the conference? Yes, and be seat. <coughs> and Julien, Julien should be online. Is this okay? Is this online? Okay, good. So you remember that um, as a, the moderator of this workshop, and I'm also the clock watcher. No? Okay. So please take care of the time that has been devoted to, to you and to be sure that we achieve our, our goals in time. Okay. And so the first speaker of uh, the Polar Oceans uh, Topic one is uh, Judith. No, okay. Okay, let's go to the slide, of course, yes. There we go, okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, human CO2 emissions, mainly from the burning of fossil fuels, but also from deforestation, have led to the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. Today, we are at an atmospheric CO2 level of 419 ppm.
that is 50% higher than in the pre-industrial times in the 18th century. In response, the Earth has warmed at a rate which is unprecedented in at least 2,000 years. But this warming and associated extreme events that we feel in our everyday lives, such as droughts, heat waves, or extreme rain, would be much more severe without the service of the oceans, and in particularly the polar oceans. The oceans take up a quarter of our annual CO2 emissions. And without this ocean carbon uptake, atmospheric CO2 levels would today not be 419 ppm, but 500. And the associated climate change and extreme weather events would be much more severe. The polar oceans stand out as they are the main conduit for this ocean carbon uptake and responsible for 50% of the total ocean carbon uptake. In addition, the oceans also take up vast amounts of heat from the atmosphere and thereby further mitigate climate change. In fact, of all the additional heat in the Earth system, which is caused by the greenhouse gases, the ocean has accumulated 90% of all this heat. And again, the polar oceans stand out because 80% of this ocean heat uptake has entered the ocean through the polar basins. So I think it's fair to conclude that to a large extent, the polar oceans control the rate at which the Earth is warming in response to our human CO2 emissions. Uh, next slide. Okay, let's go. So the reason why the, the, the polar oceans are so crucial to the heat and carbon uptake that you did just mentioned is the global ocean circulation. And here I've got a schematic of this global ocean circulation on a world map that is probably a bit distorted to what you are used to. So a world map in a, in a spillover projection, it's called. That's center on the Southern Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean is at the top here. What this schematic shows is the global ocean circulation with the red arrow being the near surface current, the blue arrow, the bottom ocean currents. And what is clear here is that the polar ocean are the two engines of this global ocean circulation. This global ocean circulation is key for our climate. It's what regulates our climate. Jean-Baptiste, just a point. For the team, technique, is it possible to have a return on the screen? Merci. Sorry. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so the, yes, these two polar oceans are the two engines of this global ocean circulation, which regulates our climate on, the, on, on, on centuries to thousands of years. And the reason why the polar oceans are the two engines is because in this region, you've got uh, processes that provide turbulence to the ocean, that, that make the surface ocean sink at the bottom of the ocean and take up climate signal from the atmosphere to the deep seas. Those processes that I mentioned are the hostile climate, like winds and waves, the presence of sea ice, the presence of ice sheet, all these connections make the, 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 the surface ocean turbulent and, and create a link between the surface and the deep seas. Now we are concerned today because we, we understand this circulation is changing. Uh, we know that it will continue to change in the future. And the reason why is because we know that the polar ocean are changing rapidly with change in sea ice, in the ocean characteristic themselves, and also in ice shelf. Next slide, please. Okay, so Julian? Is Julian online, please? I'm online. Okay, good. Oh, great. <laughs> For us to you, Julian. Yeah, so, thank you. As everyone is, is well aware, the polar regions are undergoing a very rapid state. Um, this is especially striking because the depleting sea ice cover, which in many ways has been a child of climate change. Thanks to more than four decades of satellite observation, scientists have been able to document how quickly the sea ice cover is vanishing, with a loss of more than 40% of this area since the late 1960s. This data record, combined with other historical sea ice is long enough for us to now be able to directly attribute the loss to atmospheric CO2, establishing a relationship that every metric ton of CO2 added to the atmosphere, we lose another three square meters per year. 
In this way, sea ice doesn't care about time. It cares about how much more CO2 we're going to add to the atmosphere. With another 700 gigatons of carbon added, we, we will start to see our first summits with no CO2. Given global emissions of 40 gigatons of carbon every year, that gives us a time frame of about 20 years. The stark reality is that governments are not prepared for the impacts of no more security than the Arctic Ocean. Sea ice helps to keep our planet cooler than it otherwise would be, reflecting the majority of the sun's energy out of space. As the sea ice shrinks, the ocean absorbs that sun's energy and warms up, leading to an Arctic that is three times faster than a global average. When we talk about limiting global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius, that means warming in the Arctic seven degrees Celsius to five degrees. The outsized warming of the Arctic latitudes has far reaching effects on the atmosphere and ocean circulation patterns, such that changes happening in the Arctic won't they impact the entire planet. Uh, next slide. Okay. <clears throat> Non, c'est le mot. Est-ce que vous pouvez voir derrière Qu'est-ce qui se passe Voilà. Non, sorry. Yes, so the sound was uh, really, really bad. So if I can just summarize in, yes, in, in 10 Thank seconds. Uh, the sea ice is shrinking, has shrunk over the past 40 years. And sea ice cover directly depends on our cumulative emissions. So at the rate at the current rate of emissions in 20 years, summer's Arctic sea ice will have disappeared. So, uh, and, and the, the fact that the, the big concern here is of course uh, the change of the habitat that we'll talk about later, but also the fact that sea ice is, sea ice disappearing uh, is a self-reinforcing uh, uh, things for the warming, so the, the Arctic warming is very fast and, and that's uh, uh, impact the Earth's energy budget. So, sorry, Julian, if I didn't uh, give credit to your message, but I think I, I just wanted to, uh, so everyone can understand the message. Yeah, okay. I think that I'm having feedback. Okay, well, thank you very much. So now we move to the next one with Judith. Sorry. Right, so as um, sea ice is rapidly changing, we've just seen, and heard, but the oceans are also rapidly changing um, in response to the service that they provide to us, the uptake of carbon and heat. So the water masses in the Southern Ocean are experiencing rapid change, they are warming. We observe the um, <coughs> most rapid deep sea warming in the Southern Ocean. This warming extends to great depth and from here it will distribute it globally with the ocean circulation. Ocean warming means that the water expands in volume and this leads to sea level rise. But warming in the Southern Ocean also means um, melting of the Antarctic ice sheet. In fact, the warming of the ocean is the main reason for the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet. The, the ocean carbon uptake causes acidification. As the polar oceans take up most carbon, of course they also um, see the largest acidification. But this acidification is also further amplified by freshwater input, especially the, ice, um, the sea ice melt in the Arctic. So the acidification um, threatens the unique and diverse polar ecosystems. Unfortunately, both these illustrated impacts also affect the further ocean carbon and heat uptake. So warming and acidification both act to reduce the surface ocean CO2 uptake and warming in addition leads to um, a reduction of the transfer of carbon and heat to the deep interior ocean. One important knowledge gap that we urgently need to close is how these current changes will affect the future carbon and heat uptake in the polar oceans. For this, we need to test and train our models with currently ongoing changes, observed changes in the polar oceans. But this again is hindered by a lack of observations from physics to chemistry to biology and the unsustained nature of these observations. Thank you. So Jean-Baptiste again. 
Yeah, so as Judith just mentioned, this, the warming of the Southern Ocean caused a loss of ice in Antarctica. We observed this, this, this uh, ice melt in Antarctica. We, for, we've been observing it for decades. We observed that this loss of ice in Antarctica is accelerating. It's actually regionally dependent. Most of the, of the loss that we observe is in the West Antarctic, where there is a huge potential for sea level rise, up to three meters. This uh, would have dramatic consequences for our coasts. In the recent years, we've also observed uh, a melt in the East Antarctic starting. And so this melt caused sea level rise. We also know that ocean ice interactions can be self-reinforcing, leading to destabilization of the Antarctic ice sheet. By, um, by which we would lose large part of the Antarctic, which causing large sea level rise. And this uncertainty, we have, that's, that's processes that we often call tipping point, which we, you might have heard. We, have, we know that they exist. We know from our natural archive that in the past they have existed. We don't exactly know when they can be kicked off. And that's a big uncertainty in understanding. What we know is that if they start kicking off in, in the, uh, before the, the end of the century, that will lead to up to 1.6 meter, 1.6 meter of sea level rise by the end of the century. That's the IPCC assessment that was published in last August. And that would have dramatic consequences for the vulnerable stakeholders, like many in Europe. Greenland is also melting, representing all but a quarter of current uh, level of sea level. And this adding, uh, the, the, the melt of Greenland and Antarctic add fresh water at the top of the oceans. And this fresh water that we add at the top of the ocean by melting the polar ice cap is changing the circulation. We know that this, the circulation, uh, the global ocean circulation that I was mentioning earlier is uh, will slow down in the future and might have started to slow down. We know that in the North Atlantic, similar processes going on in the, in the Southern Ocean. That will impact the ability of the oceans to help us by mitigating climate change, by storing carbon and heat that will reduce their ability. That has also implication for regional climates, especially in Europe. Next slide. Okay, please. thank you very much. So Julian again, North Antarctic. Okay, I hope you can hear me better this time. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I kind of want to sum up that, you know, the, in the polar regions are truly a unique part of our planet and regions that have fascinated us with their remoteness, their harsh and beautiful landscapes and wildlife for many generations. But these regions are now among the fastest changing on the planet, yet there is much we still do not know our polar oceans remain rather poorly observed, and we lack understanding of many key processes and feedbacks on how the polar ocean interacts with other components of the climate system and how they are represented in climate models. And this reduces our confidence on future projections needed for informing policy. So for example, we're doing okay with observing the two-dimensional system, but we are still poorly monitoring the system in 3D. While innovative observing platforms are needed to better sample the oceans, it is also important to continue our long-term observing systems, including satellite missions. The more than four decades of observations of sea ice, for example, comes from a series of satellites that were launched by the United States, but this program has been discontinued and the current satellites that are flying are past their expected lifetimes. Thus, we risk data gaps in key observations of our polar regions. And these regions can be difficult to access and pose major logistical challenges Need to continue in expeditions, such as what the Mosaic expedition, as well as collaboration for future satellite missions, which are extremely costly. To sum up, the polar oceans have helped to shape unique ways of life and ecosystems in the Arctic, the Antarctic, and beyond. And we're not ready for the multiple environmental, climatic, cultural, and economic stresses continued changes to these oceans are going to bring. We need to continue our investments and monitor these critical areas of the planet. Next slide. Thank you. So now we'll invite uh, Jérôme to wrap up the topic, topic one. Thank you very much, Paul. If you could just put the background picture to highlight uh, scientists working in the Arctic and the very harsh conditions. It's a beautiful picture taken by Julien during the mosaic expedition. I, I think we will see it in a few, in a few seconds. S'il vous plaît, l'équipe technique, je ne peux pas passer la diapositive suivante. Well, in any case, I hope you understood from uh, our three distinguished speakers, 
who are specialists of polar oceans, that uh, there are several bullet points okay. um, when it comes to the physics of polar oceans. First of all, it's very clear that the polar oceans, although being so remote from where we live, most of us human beings, are key drivers of the state of our planet and of its future. We, citizens of planet Earth, are lucky to rely on such a buffering system which took away a large part of the extra carbon dioxide and cumulated greenhouse energy that our human activities added in the climate system since 200 years. But such a buffering system is not granted forever. The warming of waters interacting with floating ice shelves, notably in Antarctica, may lead to the destruction of the later, then destabilizing the grounded ice sheet and leading to possibly several meters of additional sea level increase. The ability of polar oceans to pump away a large part of the CO2 and heat being added in the atmosphere by human activities is fragile, and it may at some point become interrupted, leading to a largely amplified greenhouse effect and additional global warming. Lastly, the evolution of freshwater inputs, notably in the Arctic Ocean, may have maj major impacts on the currents of the global oceans, with possibly strong consequences on regional climate. As a paleoclimatologist, I can also stress that our observations from past climate changes, notably the last transition from glacial to interglacial conditions, which took place from 20,000 years ago to about 11,000 years ago, demonstrated a major reorganization of the ocean circulation at that time, which contributed in a large part to the natural release in the atmosphere of tenth of ppm of carbon dioxide, which was stored before in the deep Austral Ocean and which contributed to the natural warming, which took place at that time. Therefore, the, mechanis the mechanisms exist, and they worked in the past. They could well be reactivated under modern and future conditions. For policymakers, as well as for citizens, an absolute need is to draw precise trajectories for the future regarding these physical phenomena taking place in polar oceans and their dependency on global CO2 emissions. However, precise trajectories will not be drawn without a considerable increase in our ability to observe the processes at work. This means to coordinate international efforts around observations of the polar oceans, and notably to improve our ability to document over long periods of time the unknown territories, corresponding notably to the sectors below the sea ice, below the ice shelves, and more generally the intermediate and deep oceans all being probably less well known today than the surface of the moon. In conclusion from this topic one, I think it appears urgent that heads of state combine their effort to organize an international scientific community and launch ambitious and coordinated observation programs of these remote environments difficult to access, but so vital for our future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to our colleagues. So please, um, we now will move off, off topic. OK. And so um, this topic will be uh, introduced by Eileen. Eileen is um, online. She is from Aldominion University, USA. Alva, Alvaro Sotelo, uh, he should be online. I'm not sure about that. Uh, is from the Universita de la Repubblica Uruguay. And Guillaume, Guillaume Massé, is from the uh, Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle, over here. And the wrap-up will be done by Jan Robert Kuder, who is the Deputy Director of the French Polar Institute. Okay? So two people in the room. Oh, sorry. Two people in the room and two online, I guess. Is this okay? Do we have two people online? Okay, we'll see, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, so the floor is to you, yeah?
Okay, so our previous speakers really kind of uh, made it clear the poles are mattering. Um, Jérôme has been talking about buffer. I usually um, kind of uh, uh, use the word thermostat myself. And I think this is a clear reason why they are important. Something that um, you may not have heard from Julianne because it was a bit uh, hectic is that she said that whilst here, according to the Jack, we if um, we can limit it to 1.5 degree. Excuse-moi, Guillaume. Uh, Est-il possible d'avoir les diapositives? On n'a pas accès aux diapos. So in any case, if we can limit it to 1.5 degree here, this will mean 7 degree in the Arctic. So that's what we call polar amplification. So 1.5 degree in temperate regions means 7 degree in the Arctic. So one more up. Yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, the Arctic is very important as a buffer. But in fact, well, the Arctic and the Antarctic, polar regions. But in fact, when we think about polar regions, uh, we, it's also important to think about the life it contains. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but um, in the Arctic, for example, it's millions of birds, even billions. Uh, in the Antarctic, it's millions of penguins, which are birds as well, but billions as well. <laughs> so... And <laughs> And in the Arctic, there is also people living there, and that is very important. But um, not only birds, uh, in the water, there is huge amount of biomass, in fact. Uh, probably most of the biomass on Earth, I would say. But in any case, um, very important as well to take that into consideration, and especially to consider it in the fate of climate change, what will happen, pressure, human pressure, uh, and things like that. So. Uh, we understood that, countries understood that, there is big uh, kind of um, census um, uh, kind of uh, programs. Uh, for example, in the Arctic, you've got the Arctic um, Assessment Monitoring Program, the AMAP. And um, uh, in the Antarctic, you have also... So, Alvaro? Is Alvaro online? I'm afraid not. <coughs> So if, Alvar if yes. Alvaro is not online, I will speak you for are him. Right. Okay. Uh, ba basically, yes, in the Antarctic, we also have uh, censuses that have taken place, the, censuses, the census of Antarctic marine life. Uh, and do you have some example of what was found actually in, uh, on the right side of the, of the slide, uh, showing the extreme diversity of the wildlife, the biodiversity that we find in this place. So all these informations were compiled in a three kilo atlas. It's a big baby to, cons to consult. I don't recommend that you read it at night uh, by your bed sheet. It's a bit too heavy for that. But there is more than 9,000 species uh, that have been mapped, precisely mapped, uh, from the Antarctic. And among them, like 600 new species, for instance, of starfish being discovered. So uh, what it means, basically, and maybe if you can get me the next slide, it would be sure. a good illustration, is that yeah. we have still lots of things to discover. We, we think we have mapped the Southern Ocean. We've just scratched the surface of it in a way. Uh, you can see on the left, for instance, I'm sorry that the text is not appearing correctly, but, but on the left side, you have a picture of uh, some, some fish nests which were taken uh, by uh, a, mi a mission in the Weddell Sea from the, from the Alfred Wegener Institute. Um, and you can see that the image we traditionally have of uh, fish is put into questions when you see them nesting like this so perfectly. And that's something completely new. So we still have millions of things to discover. Um, I don't remember who was supposed to speak next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. You were supposed to speak a little I continue. Longer, but I continue. Well, <laughs> then, uh, as you can see, it requires a lot of effort. Uh, on, on, the middle slide, on the middle of the slide, you have a map uh, that shows basically uh, all the, the, the tracks of ships that were required to actually gather the information for these 9,000 species. It was a huge coordinated e effort. Each color correspond to a different nation uh, putting his ship and people for several months to try to investigate the ocean. But you can see one thing is that when you look at the tracks, they are all going from the rest of the world 
to Antarctic Station because they are mainly doing some supplies. Sometimes they go on to transect here and there. But the main routes are always the same. And that means that some places, I know I'm not supposed to do that, but I will do it anyway. <laughs> you know that some places are actually uh, still quite empty in terms of effort. And that's something which uh, is maybe a priority for us. It's to track what's going on in these places that we don't know. And now I leave you to speak. So he did exactly something I wanted to do for the, for the first second. Perfect. But so we if move to the next slide? It, no, no. If <laughs> it's the same in the Arctic, in fact. If you look, for example, at this blue circle, um, I guess that if a boat goes there, they will be called as true explorers, in fact, because it has never been navigated. A ship has never been there. And though it is a key area, um, I don't know if you've seen the, the first, you noticed on the first graph when the, there was this animation of sea ice in the Arctic, but you could clearly see that this is the, the area where the last permanent sea ice will be seen is around this blue rectangle. So it's important to be able to go there and to see what will happen and to have a look in the past, as Jérôme did, uh, and see what, what, is, what will happen in the future, in fact. Yes, so remember that the Lincoln Sea so if you miss the rail, it was the next year. <laughs> Thank you. So now we move. Yes? No? I'm sorry. Is it? So this should be Eileen. Eileen. Oh, sorry. So is Eileen online, please? Eileen? Eileen Hoffman is from the US. OK. Yeah, she was. Ah, excellent. Yeah. Hello. I... Hello. <laughs> Hello there. How are you? <laughs> Okay, so um, as mentioned by uh, Guillaume and uh, Jan, there is, a there is need for continued measurements and implementation of new measurement technologies to assess polar ecosystems. The breadth and the type of observations required to measure Southern Ocean ecosystem that is illustrated in the figure that you're seeing here. These observation systems also support uh, models that allow us to project the effect of change on. Is it possible to have the images? Sorry. Okay. The emergence of new technologies like environmental DNA technology, which is shown in this figure, is opening a new way to observe polar food webs. Oh, so, I think Guillaume? So, Guillaume, no? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, what is sure is that going to sample there is extremely complex. Um, we need chips. As, as Jan said, uh, very, um, um, well, it's very expensive. Uh, we've got um, little to be seen, in fact, because it takes a lot of time to be sampling there. So um, basically, um, well, we need a complex array of uh, monitoring and take all the opportunities to do so. Um, myself, I'm more familiar with sea ice, for example, and you see this green in the sea ice. Um, well, this is primary productivity, so the basis of the food chain when you talk about ecosystems. And in the open ocean, it's fairly simple to analyze and quantify this primary production. You use a satellite, you look at the color of the water, and then with an algorithm, you can say there is much, that much of phytoplankton. If you go in ICCs, um, it's much more difficult. It doesn't work, in fact, with satellites. So you need to either to take a ship or maybe kind of be creative, a bit like uh, now. I mean, if you think about it, you've got probably 50% or 80% of the data which are kind of uh, collected using... Yeah, yeah I, can, I can jump on this one if you want. Uh, what you can see here, or maybe you can't see from the, the back, but it's a seal, and it's a seal instrumented with data recording devices. So that's an approach which has exploded over the past 20, 30 years. And basically what these seals, or penguins, could be a penguin also now, 
Uh, what, what these animals are doing is they are sampling that we know where they go, we know how deep they dive, but we can also know what the temperature of the water they dive in. Then we can know also what's the uh, biomass of prey that they find in front of them, like thanks to little sonars. And we can also measure the bioluminescence, we can measure the primary productivity. So they become auxiliaries or assistants for sonographers. And as the numbers you were uh, trying to come up with are that basically 80% of the uh, oceanographic profiles taken down from 60 degrees south are taken by seals, not by any other means. So that shows you how important they are for the global modeling and the global understanding of uh, the system. But all these arrays of things, all these tools, all these instrumentation, and this is very important, should not totally replace human involvement in these places, in these remote places. We can't ask a seal to take uh, information on everything. We can't have satellites that will go through the sea ice. We can't send buoys that will tell us what's going on like at 2,000 meter deep under the sea ice. We still need ships to go there, ships that will bring humans to do the work also there. And that's one of the key points that is written here. <laughs> Thank you for the black screen, that's perfect. <laughs> And what is important is that we need to do that also, also over the long term. Going there for a snapshot or having one seal just doing the job is not enough. We need to be able to do, like the physical sciences, accumulate data without gap so that we have a complete picture of what's going on. Next slide, if we okay. may. Okay, maybe Jack makes a point. Time is running, actually. Okay. And so you will be over time. Okay, so please do it quickly, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, as, you, as you could see uh, from previous speaker, uh, the sea ice is retreating. Um, basically, the red bits, the red areas, are areas where sea ice has been um, retreated or kind of uh, less concentrated in 20, 2020 instead of uh, uh, tw the, the average 2003 to 2019 concentration. And what you can see, uh, you can see that these corresponds to green areas, and in fact, it's where there is enhanced productivity uh, in the area. And uh, so we might think, in fact, global kind of analysis, they say that the primary productivity, so the basis of the food chain, uh, is increasing at the moment in the Arctic. So you may think that it might be uh, a good news, but if you look, it's very regional, in fact. it's. Um, if, if, if you look, you have a lot of brown areas, and these brown areas, primary productivity is kind of uh, uh, decreasing. Okay, maybe could Eileen com comment? This next slide, please. Is this better? Yes. Eileen, it's yours. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so, um, let me know. Eileen, you can, you can hear your paper flush. <laughs> all right, can, can you hear me all right now? Yes. Okay, so in the, in the figure here on the right-hand side, we see that the Antarctic food web in this particular schematic is supported by, at the bottom is supported by, by, by the phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. So this is a krill-centric food web, and it is only one of many food webs in the Southern Ocean. Okay, and in this food web, a single species, the Antarctic krill, provides a connection between primary production and the predators. So this makes this food web vulnerable to conditions that change the availability of krill. Also point out that humans appear in this food web in the, in the lower right corner and because the, the exploitation of fisheries and natural resources in both polar regions is anticipated to increase. So the effect of this on the food webs is, is unknown. And it's important to recognize that there is considerable heterogeneity in food webs in the polar regions. Environmental change 
and resource extraction have the possibility of producing conditions that will alter these food webs. So what we need to do is understand and measure the present day food webs so that we can detect and assess the effects of change. So the next slide, please. Okay, actually I would suggest uh, to Jan to take the lead because we will be out yeah. of time and just make the comment and the wrap up, yes. Thank you. So you want me to do the wrap-up now? Paul, you want me to do the wrap-up? No, I can comment. Okay, okay. So no, very briefly, apparently, uh, so as you can see here, it's quite a difficult slide to read. But what is important is that it applies both to the Arctic and the Antarctic. And there is a large variety of threats that we've heard already a bit uh, in this morning or in the previous session. There is plastic coming in. We found plastic in the Antarctic. There is a lot of uh, regional ice change. Uh, there is a lot of acidification, and this is super important for all the shell organisms. So basically, we can wrap up this slide and go to the next one. Yes. And uh, one important thing is, we, may, we heard that in the topic one this morning, connectivity. As you can see, the Southern Ocean is connected for physical uh, parameters. We've heard about that. It's also con connected when we speak about life. As you can see here, these, these arrows are just migrations, basically, of animals going in and out from the Antarctic and going to lower latitude. I actually had a better image that they refused to keep, which is shame. But it's the, the Antarctic tern. The Antarctic tern is actually a bird that does every year a migration from the Antarctic to the Arctic. So crossing all the, all the Earth like this. And that demonstrates how this animal can actually uh, bring simply parasites or microbes on their, on their legs and disperse them all over the Earth. This image here on the right is showing you uh, the eigenvectors. That's uh, scientific terms for just saying like uh, idealized lines connecting two points. Uh, and basically here you have the Antarctic Peninsula around these dots that receive up to 900 to 1,000 visits every year from all over the world. So when people say the, the Antarctic is remote, when I hear this kind of image to promote the tourism, for instance, of the Antarctic, I would say it's less and less remote. So you should really enjoy it now for its remoteness before it becomes the next hub. Next slide. Yeah. And so that's the, the last slide, uh, basically, for this topic which is we as scientists start to have a good image of what things, uh, what, you know, how things are working down there. We are still need, in need of more information, but we can already give precious information for stakeholders that want to protect these places. Here you have, for instance, on the, on the left, uh, a sort of habitat important, importance map for diverse predators. The, the yellowish colors show that not only one species of predator is interested in these zones, but a variety of them. So if several predators are in the same zone, it means there are lots of food, but lots of diverse food. So it's hyper important to protect. And above it, you have in pink the planned uh, marine protected areas, and in orange, the existing ones. And you can see that there is fairly a good overlap. So it's not so bad in the Antarctic, even though some of them would be needed to be more complete in terms of cover of the, of the wildlife. When you go to the Arctic, you can see a lot of green. So it seems like, wow, these places are super important. But there is no MPA, as far as I know. So it becomes urgent. And there was some discussion this morning in the governance topic, which was super interesting. It becomes a, an, an emergency sorry, to get these, these places and protect them. But that's for topic three. So that allows me to wrap up. Thank you. <laughs> so many thanks to our three speakers. Uh, this has been a quick portrait of the biodiversity in the, uh, in, in the polar zones. Um, I will jump on some of the things I wrote here, because first, my, I don't have my glasses. And second, uh, I think I've already spoke about most of them. Now, what is important, I still, is that so you should go back thinking we still have a lot to discover down there. We still have new species, probably housing new molecules that could be tomorrow's remedy for some disease, from emerging diseases. 
We have new bacteria that can serve also uh, to resolve pollution. We have in the subantarctic some bacteria that could degrade plastic at a higher rate than what we can find in, uh, in temperate zones. So that's something to explore, of course. And we know virtually nothing of how the system actually work under the sea ice. The sea ice is the next territory for us to explore. So uh, I would say that luckily we have the tools to do that. We have the methods, we have the approaches, and we briefly touched on them. I mean, it would be super interesting to do a full talk about the, the diverse method, like the seal carrying instrument. I could speak for hours, but I'm not authorized. So uh, I, I would say, you know, we just need to coordinate them. For the moment, everybody is using it in its approaches, in its own program. Sometimes there are some collaborations, sometimes there are coordinated census. We have to go one step up. We have to really have the heads of states, the government telling us, we put the money for you to work together and to go in these places, de de deploy your arrays of tools, and get us a synoptic view of what's going on in these places. But don't forget. What was really important it was we still need human to do that. Automatization won't do the whole trick. I heard that sometimes, and it tickled my brain, to say the least. So topic one mentioned it. I have no shame in paraphrasing or the wrap-up of Dr. Chaplaz. He's my boss, after all. It's easy to. <laughs> so heads of states need to give us the possibility to increase considerably our ability to observe the processes at work by coordinating international effort around observation of the polar oceans, sending people exploring the unknown territories. I would add that in parallel to this polar effort, there is also an urgent need for heads of state to act on other stressors that threaten the poles. Eradicating single-use plastic, reducing pesticides and greenhouse gases. This could be a good start to a sustainable ocean, as polar oceans, temperate oceans, tropical oceans, because they are all one ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we move to <laughs> topic number three. Well, OK, it's coming. So we have, we have um, four speakers. Um, first, we have Antonio uh, Quezada. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes. So first, we have Antonio Quezada, which will be online, okay. and Nicole Viebo, which is over here, and also uh, Jacob Radit, I'm sorry, Radit is correct? Yes, sir. Oh, perfect. And of course, Mary, <laughs> Merit, who I start from the uh, University of Tom Tromway, Norway, actually, is, is uh, very north, is in the Tromsø, okay? That's correct? Thank you. So... <laughs> And the first speaker is Antonio, actually. Antonio is line, perfect. The problem is that we should see the, the slides. Okay. Thank you. There you go. So, Thank Antonio. You much, Paul. Thank you very much. As uh, we all know, both polar regions are, are geographically, geographically different and subjected to different governance principles. The Antarctic is ruled by the Antarctic Treaty System, which started in 1959 and entered into force in 1961 as a political necessity based on scientific collaboration. Starting with 12 members, and now it has 53 countries. Hold on, I want to reduce my volume here because it's too high. Okay, now I think it's going to be much better. So, on the other hand, the Arctic is ruled by the eight countries that they have the territories or jurisdictional waters in the Arctic. The Antarctic Treaty System is based on a treaty which is legally binding to the signatories and is open to any country which fulfills the requirements. A relevant aspect is that Antarctica does not belong to any country. Although a number of countries have territorial claims over the land and the ocean surrounding, by signing the treaty, they freeze their claims. The most relevant aspect is that the treaty limits the military activity and the presence only to the support to the science, which becomes the most relevant activity in the continent. 
The treaty also promotes the international <coughs> collaboration and the free movement and inspection in all the continent installations. A number of different instruments are the framework for the activity of the Antarctic Treaty System. One of the most important ones is the Protocol of the Antarctic Treaty for Environmental Protection. It is, we also have the SEALS Convention and the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine um, uh, Living Resources, CAMELAR. These instruments have committees that discuss different aspects about their terms of reference and in the case of the CEP, it discusses all items related with the environmental protection and decides what topics and in what uh, way should be delivered to the Antarctic Treaty uh, Consultative Meeting that takes place once a year. Once the ATCN decides by consensus, this is the missing word under the arrows, consensus, this is a very important the key word of my talk, but it's missing here, sorry. Uh, in most cases, the decisions are incorporated into the national legislation of the members. The Arctic uh, governance, on the other way, is organized by the Arctic Council, which is formed by the eight Arctic countries, six permanent participants, the native nations, and a number of observers, both organizations and countries. The activity of the Arctic Council is mainly political and oversees the working groups of the Antarctic Council where observers can participate actively. The decisions are also taken by consensus, again consensus, and are not legally binding. Sovereignty is never discussed and therefore military activity is not a topic, although security is treated in an ever-increasing fashion. The main purposes of the Arctic Council meetings is discuss the cooperation, coordination and interaction among the Arctic states with the active involvement of Arctic indigenous peoples and Arctic residents on common Arctic issues. The Arctic government has working groups in which the observers can participate and besides that in the Arctic Science Ministerial, in which the, uh, we have the Arctic Science Ministerial, in which the uh, science ministers of any country interested in scientific issues in the Arctic can become a member. Next slide, please. I would like to illustrate in this new slide the assessed story of collaboration and coordination of activities in the Antarctic. This is the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs. This is where the official operators of the countries doing scientific activities in, in the Antarctic meet annually. The objective of this organization is to develop and promote the best practice in managing and support the scientific research in Antarctic. However, this is not just a forum for discussion of practices, but in fact, it promotes international partnership following the spirit and mandate of the Antarctic Treaty. This organization counts with 31 members and in total manages 117 facilities, 86 research stations, 40 of them are year-round stations and many vessels. In general terms, the operators in this group are facilitating more than 500 scientific projects per year. The activity of this organization has created a culture of collaboration which is transiting towards a culture of sharing and facilitation of purely international initiatives. I have illustrated that governance of both polar regions being so different, in fact, brings common elements up, as, for example, the consensus as a tool for taking decisions. Consensus is apparently weak and a slow way of taking decisions, but at the same time, is a system that allows and guarantees harmonious functioning. Nevertheless, this system is vulnerable and some countries or partners can block any activity because of agendas far away from the discussions, uh, discussion topics. A take-home message would be that we need to protect our working system and convince the partners about the useful, usefulness of the organizations and that, that have been working for the last 60 years and deserves at least 60 more years. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now the floor is to Nicole. Um, yeah, it's working. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, I will give you now in the following few minutes a short overview 
on what the European Union and European organizations and projects are doing to support research and cooperation at the poles. I will focus mainly on the Arctic. That has a reason because the EU just recently launched its new Arctic policy, but up to now does not have a policy for the Antarctic or the Southern Ocean. I start my summary with a citation of Michael Mann, the EU Special Envoy to, the, uh, to Arctic Matters, who recently said that all what the EU does in the Arctic has to be based on solid science and research. This research shall encourage closer links between the science community, innovative businesses, and very important, local and indigenous communities. European research, by the way, is also a fantastic tool to reaching out to our international partners and an important tool for science diplomacy. In more detail, the EU will strengthen with its new Arctic policy international cooperation, contributing to maintaining peaceful and constructive dialogue and a cooperation in a changing geopolitical landscape to keep the Arctic safe and sustainable and stable. It will address the ecological, social, economic, and political challenges arising as the consequences of climate change, taking strong action to tackle climate change and environmental degradation, making the Arctic more resilient. And it strives to support inclusive and sustainable development of the Arctic regions to the benefit of its inhabitants and future generations focusing on the need of indigenous people, women, and the youth, and investing in future-oriented jobs and the blue economy. Since we are speaking here about the ocean, I will also give you a short summary what the EU wants to do in terms of ocean management and ocean research. So the EU will negotiate for a strong agreement on BBNJ and contribute to the implementation of the agreement to prevent unregul unregulated high seas fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean. It will support the designation of marine protected areas in the Arctic Ocean. We just saw that we urgently need some. It will also strengthen the capacity of Copernicus Marine Environment Monitoring Services to address the specific needs in the ocean. And it will fund research to improve the understanding of the long-distance transports of plastic waste from the North Atlantic and air transport of microplastic. It will lead the drive for zero emission and zero pollution shipping in the Arctic Ocean and promote faster and more ambitious emission reductions for Arctic shipping. And for researchers, very important, it has implemented a Horizon Europe mission to restore our ocean and seas with a lighthouse on the Arctic and the Atlantic. It mobilizes the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance to strengthen Arctic research and also Southern Ocean research to make it truly reaching from pole to pole. And in this respect, I should mention that Commissioner Maria Gabriel just recently announced an indigenous fellow as US ambassador for the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance. Next slide, please. May I suggest from make it short? Yes. Yes, I'm very short yeah. now. Uh, sorry. Um, um, I have listed here several organizations who are working together to, oh, that's not that's, yeah. previous slide, yeah. who are working together to support this mission. All these organizations listed here are working on both poles. And, um, Maybe I only mention two of them very quickly. We have on the one side the European Polar Board, which is an independent organization focusing on major strategic priorities at both poles. It improves coordination in the Arctic and Antarctic, and it's optimizing infrastructure use and joint initiatives by its members. And then EU Polar Net 2 which um, is a consortium of all European countries uh, performing polar research. And uh, we, uh, EU Polar Net 2, has written a European polar research program, which is the basis for the future funding uh, based on the EC. So to sum up very shortly, I hope you saw that there's a lot of engagement in the Arctic especially, but also in the Southern Ocean by European organizations. 
a lot of coordination is currently taking place and um, this is really successful but it is definitely not sustained. So when the projects run out, all this coordination and international cooperation will get lost. Thank you very much. So now, Jacob. Thank you so much. So uh, in this uh, brief overview, I will focus on the governance and management of the Antarctic marine space. I will do that in my role as the chair of the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, which in short is CAMELAR. The chairmanship uh, of CAMELAR is rotating between its 26 uh, members in alphabetical order, and Sweden took over from Spain uh, in November 2020. And of course, our chairmanship is based on respect for international rule-based order ground or international law. So on this exhibit, uh, we can see how the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean connect with the Southern Ocean or water surrounding Antarctica, as some prefer to call it. And in early presentations, we have learned about uh, the polar ocean, the Antarctic circumpolar current, and how they function as a major climate regulator, really well presented. Well, the marine life of the Southern Ocean has been harvested since 1790, when sealers first uh, hunted seals for their pelts, and then moved on to harvest whales. And large-scale fishing for finfish began, began in the late 1960s, and krill fishing began in the mid-1970s. And by the late 1970s, some species had been overfished in some areas, and fishing was unregulated. Other pressures, as we have heard in more recent times, relate to, for example, the increasing number of tourists and invasive species related to increasing shipping in the Southern Ocean. Uh, next slide, please. So let's explore a little bit the governance and management framework. As we have heard, the Antarctic Treaty System is a unique set of international legal instruments governing human pressures in the Antarctic region and guiding future coexistence. And the Antarctic Treaty stipulates that Antarctica shall only be used for peaceful purposes and secure freedom of scientific investigation. And before and since the signing of the Antarctic Treaty, multiple associated agreements have been reached to build a governance and management regime in the region that includes its marine ecosystems. The International Whaling Commission and the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Seals are two examples of that. And in the early 1980s, the Convention on the Conservation for Antarctic Marine Living Resources was adopted in, in Canberra, Australia. And this is critical. Conservation in this area is defined as rational use as well of the living resources. And this year, as we heard, we also celebrate 40 years of the work of the Commission. To address uh, overfishing, the Convention pioneered the concept of ecosystem-based management and development, developed the concept as we know it today. And this includes the different conservation measures agreed each year, uh, 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 consisting of a number of different area-based management approaches. Fisheries control and an ecosystem monitoring program are other important elements that are part of this ecosystem-based approach. And the Madrid Protocol, as just was mentioned, uh, besides regulating environmental issues, also has a system of protecting coastal areas in, in Antarctica. And these areas, you can see them as this tiny uh, red and yellow spots on the coastline here on this exhibit. And the statistical areas that guide fishing purposes are noted here in squares with numbers on them. So each of them has specific measures for, for fishing. Two MPAs have been agreed to date and they are marked in blue color. The South Orkney Islands Southern Shelf MPA and the Ross Sea MPA. And three more marine protected areas are proposed by many Camelot members. And they are also visible here in green. So from a global point of view, one can argue that there are management regimes in place. So in conclusion, the Antarctic Treaty System with its associated conventions and agreements make up a solid and nested, but not yet, as we heard in the morning, fully coordinated regional regime for the protection of the continent and the Antarctic marine space as a global public good. And, however, shifting geopolitical interests, 
related to fishing, tourism, navigation, research, and climate change are new, putting new stressors on this whole system, and Camelar in particular. And thereby, the protection area process of the blue ones has also stalled. So what could be the alternatives then, strengthening marine protection and benefit the region as a whole? Perhaps a marine spatial planning process, which is broader approach compared to marine protection only, could both consider conservation and rational use and perhaps thereby increase the interest from Camel Arm members to find common solutions. A marine spatial planning process would consider, for example, fishing, a network of marine protected areas, tourism, science, and navigation in conjunction and be based on extensive stakeholder engagement. But such a process must be promoted at the highest political level, also as we heard, to succeed. And it has to be addressed within the Antarctic Treaty system as a whole. Finally, a positive step at the recent October Camelar meeting, number 40, was uh, an agreement that a special meeting on marine protection and marine spatial planning will be organized by the Commission to explore consensus building steps for future marine protection. And I would argue these are good building blocks for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, heard reports on the changing climate and uh, changing life in polar seas, and we have now heard about how governance is organized and function both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. And this is a more regional focus on the gov governance discussions we heard this morning. We have learned how the two polar regions differ, with an open ocean uh, in the north surrounded by uh, coastal states with national jurisdiction, and with the Arctic Council as an important collaborative organization, but without open membership and legal bindings. While in the south, the Antarctic Treaty is legally binding, it's regulating activities and promotes international collaboration, both uh, running on consensus. International science collaboration is highly promoted in both polar regions, uh, and that is an important task for uh, good governance. We have also learned how EU, through the many different organizations and projects and a new Arctic strategy, has a strong interest in polar regions and particularly the Arctic. Important keywords like science diplomacy to facilitate collaboration across communities inside and outside the Arctic, especially through research and goals that includes both securing the Arctic as a peaceful and stable region and strengthen report, uh, research, improve the observations, reduce climate footprints, and action to secure marine life and biodiversity. So the challenge is to move from successful project-based initiatives, like we heard, to uh, long-term sustainable activities. We need to go on and keep on these activities. And we have learned how the Antarctic Treaty and the Camelar uh, has developed ecosystem-based management and fisheries regulation as important tool to manage the harvest of resources that place by many uh, nations in the Antarctic. A marine spatial planning process consider both protected areas but also rational use and is uh, proving to be a new good tool to increase uh, the organism and ecosystem resilience towards climate change and increased human activities. We have one ocean on our blue planet, and this ocean is being distributed across the globe, but includes the polar region, and it's well connected, as we have seen, by currents, but also atmospheric transport. These connections are essential for global climate regulation, as we have seen, and for the life in the ocean as we know. The human ocean dimension, uh, as was mentioned earlier today, is important. We breathe the oxygen produced by the ocean and we feed on the food from the ocean, also from the polar oceans. But we are increasingly impacting the ocean with major footprints also in the polar region. Through greenhouse gas emission, inducing climate change, pollution transported by ocean and atmosphere to high latitudes and through activities not always based on ecosystem-based management principles. So, the ocean and connecting ocean currents do not follow the national borders. Impact in one region will be transported to or cascade to other regions. And that's why fragmented management and governance is a major and urgent challenge. We need to overcome this fragmentation in science and management and to build holistic knowledge on the system. 
where national or uh, where national interests come into play, we should agree on common principles for ecosystem-based management, and we should agree on common uh, mechanisms for control. Collaboration is our best and only card towards a healthy and sustainable future ocean. So next slide, please. Our key message on governance can be summarized like this. We have one ocean, and we note that there are fragmented governance and management systems in both polar regions, and that there is a need to overcome this rapidly and to be reinforced through tools such as scientific collaboration, cooperation in infrastructure, and marine spatial planning through the processes mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the speaker. Now we have a, a time for a short, I should say, communication. Um, I would first invite um, uh, Dr. Ai Sakaguchi. Okay, we are very honored to have you here. Um, of course, he's from Japan, and so congratulations for all you are doing in the uh, um, Saka, Sasaka. No, I'm sorry, Sasaka Wapis Foundation. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my uh, great honor to be invited uh, at this uh, position and also thank you very much for organizing this uh, uh, workshop today. Actually, uh, this morning I asked uh, uh, Ashok, uh, the organizer of this uh, meeting, and why this big event uh, is held in this uh, such a, a bit uh, uh, risky uh, time uh, due to the pandemic. His answer is uh, ocean is really threatened, as all of us uh, mentioned here in this room. And also there is no more time to wait until the, the pandemic uh, stop. And that's why this, uh, you know, One Ocean Summit uh, is held uh, this uh, three, three days. And actually, ocean is threatened. Especially uh, the polar ocean is uh, sensitive to all the uh, threatened. But uh, as uh, Jerome mentioned, uh, it's a buffer. But uh, if uh, the function of buffer is uh, broken, what will happen? So no one can control and that's why uh, we need to explore and also we need to fully scientifically understand the function and also what is there and to know everything about uh, you know Arctic and also an Antarctic uh, area and this is why we have this uh, workshop today but uh, it the, the cost to approach and the cost to do science in such a remote area, uh, as uh, <laughs> he mentioned, it's not remote, uh, but uh, it's actually remote, right? And uh, the cost is uh, becoming higher and higher, you know, due to the, the, the fuel costs and then everything. And then uh, the basic answer uh, to, to solve this problem is, uh, uh, collaboration, as we all, you know, uh, agreed uh, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, the meaning. And then um, in this context, uh, Japan uh, already uh, started to uh, build a new icebreaker ship, but uh, uh, the traditional Japanese custom, uh, they, they say international collaboration, international collaboration, but actually it uh, never or sometimes less happened, <laughs> unfortunately. Then the, the scheme we decided is uh, we promised uh, to the, the, the Minister of uh, um, Finance and also many politicians to make this new icebreaker as a real international uh, platform. And then that's why I came here all the way uh, from uh, uh, Tokyo uh, today to make this uh, announcement. It is originally designed uh, to be an international platform, not only for Japanese uh, researchers, not only for uh, Jamstick, which I be belong to for the last 20 years and I, I quit but, uh, this uh, last year. But uh, it's not a, sh uh, a ship only for Japanese uh, researchers, but for 
all, all of us. So uh, please uh, uh, make contact uh, with me or with uh, anyone uh, who is in uh, Polar Ocean uh, Research uh, in Japan. And uh, additional comment is, uh, although it was unfortunately uh, postponed, uh, the decision was made uh, last week, but uh, uh, our uh, foundation, uh, Saskia Peace Foundation, is going to organize uh, uh, Arctic uh, Circle Japan uh, Forum, which will give many consideration, not only for scientists, but also all the many, you know, stakeholders. I will make the, you know, the announcement when will it be held, uh, maybe within a year, I, I promise. Okay. So thank, thank you very you. much. Well, time is a bit short, but I think I would like to invite um, at, at the least an um, early career scientist to, yes, okay, good, yeah. But well, <laughs> so I, I everyone, I'm uh, part of the One Ocean Summit. Uni up, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so I everyone, I'm part of the One Ocean Summit University, which was already introduced this morning by uh, Denis Bailly, uh, with my uh, colleague like um, Natalia Yopis, and uh, we kind of raised Stand question. Up. Stand up. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. But yeah, f first of all, just to speak about One Nation Summit University, do not hesitate to just go and see us. We have the Bordeaux, Bordeaux like uh, French wine, Bordeaux <laughs> wine, uh, sweet shirt. So you can go and you can just ask us and discuss with us to be really cool and to have feedback from young uh, scientists. And uh, yeah, so on. Um, as uh, Japanese is taking a step um, forward to collaborate between all of the ocean. Uh, how can we make it this one uh, for more faster for and faster for all of the nations? Like not just Japanese, not okay, we can go and go into the our boats, it is really cool, but how can we do it more faster for all the nation and like a global world? Yeah, that was the main question, Thank I you. think. Uh, Okay, maybe we have time to have a very short. I'm sorry, to have a very short communi answer. communication from uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Geneviève Pons, and uh, I'm speaking here as co-chair of uh, Antarctica 2020 Coalition. Yeah. And I have a question for Jacob. Um, in 2012. Mem the members of the CAMLA decided, agreed to create a network of NPAs around Antarctica. And what I would like to know from him is if the alternative approach he's proposing <laughs> or foreseeing of uh, uh, marine spatial planning would be compatible uh, with the respect of this decision taken in 2012. Okay, so Jacob, a short, on, short answer please, yes? Yes, thank you so much uh, Antarctica 2020 for that question. I think uh, uh, as the chair I'm just speaking about the process and realizing that the member states, they have not agreed on a consensus on further MPAs at this stage. As you saw in the presentation, they already have two MPAs, but also a whole host of other conservation measures in place. Now, the issue then is, of course, how do you reinstate a process of consensus building to achieve further protection through MPAs or through other means? And this is what the Convention now have agreed the member states to continue explore the coming year. And as a chair, I'm, of course, supportive of that, and, and I hope the best that all of us, part of this work, we promote and support such a process to get the people to the table again and find solution moving forward, especially our young colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so <laughs> may I suggest to Nicole to give an answer to um, um, students here? Yeah. Um, just to inform you that we have some very successful uh, projects which, which are sharing infrastructures 
like for example the Arise project which shares six icebreakers in the Arctic Ocean uh, where people can get access via proposal basis. Even more successful is a project which is called Interact, which shares about 90 okay. stations in the Arctic for research. Okay. And I also have to mention, of course, Eurofleets, which shares a lot of mm. vessels in the Arctic Ocean. The problem is, this is all pro project based. You know, we are doing this now very successfully. But all these projects coming to an end, and then it will be closed. So we are now hoping to find a solution how we can continue with these successful infrastructure sharing networks. Yes. Thank you very much. Maybe a last word from uh, Jean-Louis Etienne about uh, the famous Polaport project. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Pardon. I'm Jean-Louis Etienne. Um, reading all the publication about the Southern Ocean, I realize that there is a gap, a gap, and all the scientists, they answer by the same sentence. We need long period in situ measurements. So uh, with, uh, with the shipyard and the ship uh, engineering, we have designed the polar pod. The polar pod is a scientific opportunity a logistic opportunity to study the ocean and to do long period of time measurement all your long, all your young and for th three time we will do three time for three years we will drift with a current around Antarctica and uh, it will be uh, four scientists on board and three marine and uh, with many instruments there is four topics air sea exchange measuring the co2 absorption of the ocean second uh, polar pod is uh, uh, there is no engine at all there is no generator it moves with the current it drifts with the current so it's a silent vessel we will have hydrophone on board and we will do um, a census of my life by acoustic the third is uh, a uh, question from the, the space agency. We will do a calibration of some measurements, especially the color of the ocean. And for the, the in anthropic impact, we will do uh, some sample and we analyze sample. So we plan to start to drift from the south, southeast of the south, uh, south Africa. Uh, we plan to start at the end of 23 or early 24. And it will take, I tell you, three years to sail a two-time run in Torica until probably the end of 2026. I will be 80 at the time. <laughs> okay. Thank you, John. So, I'm sure that we have a lot of candidates to be aboard the, the Polar Port. So now the final message is to Antje. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dear all, dear audience, uh, dear people listening to us uh, remotely, and dear co-speakers, especially also dear Paul for keeping us in time. I must say, 25 years ago when I was a young student, I was terribly afraid of Paul chasing me around at polar conferences when I was too long with speaking with my presentation. And now I'm a grown-up director, and I'm still very afraid of Paul chasing me away for speaking too long. So it is about long-term collaboration, as we say. Let me wrap up the key messages of the three topics and also try to understand your urgent question as the youth who is trying to learn at all and to debate and to show and to find solutions for a future for our one ocean. So topic one gave you the sense of urgency, right? When you remember the words you've heard and just for a moment think cryosphere, think frozen water, snow, sea ice, glaciers. When you think about these landscapes, they seem so foreign, they seem so extreme, they seem dangerous to us humans, but then when we speak, we assume the position of that they are vulnerable. And yes, they have become vulnerable, but in the sense that we are mostly the ones who will be hurt. I have discussed a lot with the ambassador for this meeting, Peter Thompson, who comes from Fiji, and when we discuss the fate of ice masses collapsing, when we discuss melting, oceans warming, we are discussing at the same time, when we speak polar, we're discussing the habitat, the future of islands in the Pacific. 
So one of the key messages of urgency is, is all connected and the polar systems are not just this remote place. They are part of the planet, part of humanity. When you think the story of humanity, since we have been an ape on two feet basically, we know from that story, and we are just currently rewriting it, that ice has made the difference to us. We were always vulnerable from changes. And at times, humans were just very few and then grew again. But now we speak about the future, where from 8 billion, we will be by the end of the century 10 billion, as far as the projections go. And we have to share the resources of the planet, and the cryosphere is key. In topic two, you have heard that it is more than the physical connections and the physical urgencies. Whoever of you has ever seen a whale diving next to you, listened to the whale sound, seen how this amazing life is there hosted by polar deep seas, falls in love with that amazing diversity and we are having to discovering so much. And that's also a sense of hope. You see these animals, these organisms, these plants, these bacteria that are so adapted, that are so wonderfully connected that form this network of life we depend upon. And so for me, it's a message of hope that there is life that teaches us how to cope with energy shortages, how to adapt to the most extreme dynamics. But we have to listen, we have to learn, we have to give them a name. And that's where we need science as much as the science of urgency. We will lose species, we are losing marine species at a more rapid pace as on land, which is hard to believe, but that's scientific facts. And we are losing some that have no name, no picture to them. And we don't want that, we cannot afford it. At least we can leave behind a legacy of knowledge on the life that is worth fighting for. So topic three, the governance. That's again, our hope, our solution. It's fantastic the types of treaties we have heard and discussed, and I would add the Svalbard Treaty to the list of treaties and talk to Marit about it. We have learned as humans, and we can protect the environment and us, we can help us, we can form networks, we can work hard, and I ask you who will leave this room now and go on to other workshops, be ambassador of international collaboration. Help scientists to have a voice in the political decisions, in the societal decisions. And do understand, science is one key culture of humanity. We need the other cultural sectors to support us to make humans touched and knowledgeable about the habitats we are endangering, but the habitats that we need for our survival too. I thank you very much for your attention and thank all the speakers again. And I would like to remind you again, finally, it's about us people. And so I will close this meeting again by thanking people like Paul, like Jerome, like all of you. And I thank once more, and if that's my end, Bernd, I would like once more to say the name of Yves Renou. He has been a companion for so many decades, fought for international collaboration, for infrastructures to more than just us Europeans. And we will miss him sorely, and let's all thank him once more. Thank you. Okay, so the workshop is closed now, so thanks to all of you. See you. <laughs>